Right. Well, I think that the issue really is development times, not review times, as uh, Dr. Avorn talked about. He was focusing on review times. How long does it take FDA to look at the applications? Really, the issue is how long does it take to develop the drugs? And on average, it takes about nine years to develop a drug for endocrine disorders, about six years to develop a drug for cancer. You have to go through typically three phases of clinical trials. The first phase is looking for a proof of activity. Second phase is and, looking for- And what for you do is you go and you get a group of patients, maybe 25 patients? T depending on the disease, you're either doing it in healthy volunteers or in sick patients. If you have a drug targeted to a, um, you know, a, a rare cancer or something that's uh, fatal, you're gonna put the drug in phase one in patients who are already sick. But typically, if it's a drug targeted to, let's say, hypertension, you're gonna put it in healthy volunteers. And in phase one, you're looking mostly at safety. Although you're starting okay. to look at issues of efficacy and you're starting to look at issues of dose. Phase two, you're looking at? Phase two, you're looking at proof of concept. You want to see if the drug works. You're not necessarily assessing the clinical outcomes in the clinical trial, but you're looking at indications that the drug is having the activity that you anticipated. And that's more people. More and that's more people. And depending on the disease you're looking at, it's anywhere from, it could be a couple of hundred in a cancer trial to, you know, 5,000 in a, a primary care drug. Phase three? Phase three is the pivotal trial. It's the reg registration trial, depending on the disease you're looking at. It could be a couple of thousand patients in a cancer trial at a cost of about $100,000 per patient enrolled in the trial. And in some cardiovascular trials, you're looking at trials that enroll 40 or 50,000 patients. And there you're looking for statistically rigorous evidence that the drug has a clinical effect on the desired outcome. Okay, does this side agree that that's essentially the structure of the classic trial since 1962? Yes, with, with the proviso that Dr. Gottlieb said something very important, which is how much time does the company take to develop a drug, as opposed to the matter at hand, okay. which is how long does FDA take to review it, which okay. is really what but, we're concerned oh, with. Oh, but, oh, but, oh, but, but you oh, can't. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm going to let this unleash in just a second. I, so I just, I, I, I personally felt I needed to hear that to understand what the heck it is we're talking about. We, we um, don't yet. Um, so thank you for that, and I'm glad that you mostly agree with it. But before we debate the specifics, because I think debating the specifics is what we're going to be doing, I just want to take the large question to this side that this side put to you, which is that that system that they described, they are arguing, I'm going to call it the slow track. You can object to that language. I just want to distinguish it from the fast track. They're saying the fact that the fast track had to be developed uh, and I think this does date to the, to the midst of the AIDS crisis. And it was accepted, and it worked, and drugs got out there, and they saved lives. Establishes that that regime, that one, two, three trial thing since 1962, is a problem. It's slow. It's not saving lives. And I want, it, I want it to take that point that the existence of a fast track actually wins the debate for them. Uh, Jerry Avorn. I think it was helpful that Mr. Huber gave us his views about the FDA approval process in that regard. I think it was less helpful when he gave the audience my views about that because you got it wrong. In my book, I indicated that yes, the fast track did come from AIDS activists scaring the hell out of the FDA because they were so horribly slow. And that was a good thing. And that happened in the late 80s and early 90s and FDA got better because of that excellent pressure from the AIDS community. And in the presidential panel's report that you mentioned that advocates that FDA needs to figure out more creative ways to move forward in that direction, that's also something I approve of because I was on the panel that helped write that report. So indeed, this is something good and we gotta not fight the last war and say it was terrible in 1989 and now we have a fast track and keep complaining about how things were in 1989. The fact that there's a fast track makes sense because some drugs really are breakthroughs and you wanna use the limited resources FDA has to move things forward. Would fast tracking the entire array of drugs make be an uncautious, no, it would be, uh, incautious thing to do? It would be a, an unwise use of limited resources is because we don't need to fast track the next statin of which we already have plenty. I mean, forgive me, but Peter this, Huber. this just isn't an accurate description. And first of all, fast track is a quite different term used by the FDA. It is not the accelerated approval rule. You know, call it whatever you like, but they are different things. Okay. Look, stand, under the accelerated, look, okay. look, this is absolutely unequivocal. Under the accelerated approval rule, you cut off a big chunk of what the FDA's normal uh, rules do. You actually cut off in the middle of phase three or phase, phase two, or and some people are pushing to cut off after phase one because the results are so dramatic there, okay? You are actually not doing what is normally required. And Big, you're saying, and, and, and that's and, a good And wait, thing. just a second. And who does it then? Because you still have to finish. And the answer is you do it, uh, by and large, you do it in phase four. And a lot of doctors out there are now also using the drug. And they are do, working completely independently. And they are the ones who are using the modern tools to work out how to fit these 
these rather simple drugs to our extremely complex bodies. They're finding the biomarkers on efficacy and safety. These are all emerging later. They are getting the precision medicine, and nowhere else in the FDA protocols do you get that. It never emerges during the standardized conventional protocols. You are blinded all the way through. There is no Bayesian adaption during the trials. There's you what? Just, Wait, I don't, I don't you know. You just don't get the information. Okay? No, no, I, I'm not saying it to mock you at all. I'm saying it because I don't understand and using terms of art, which if you took a minute to explain, actually would help I, us I, all. I, I put in one word, Bayesian. That means it that you're actually... Me, you're, 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 I was lost. It, it, means you're, it means you're actually looking at the data as you go and learning from it as you go and adapting to it. And the FDA okay. is so concerned about something called selection bias, they don't allow it at all. Okay, so I would just bias. add to that that the FDA FDA has actually been backing away from the accelerated approval rule in recent years, so much so that Congress had to recodify it in recent legislation and say, we really meant it. We want you to use this to try okay, to accelerate but Just for me, for me to understand, because I'm getting the gist of it, you think that's a good thing. This is a good development. Because I, I want to say is, to these is, guys, what do you think of that? It is the only place we are actually developing modern drug okay. science down right. at the molecular what about level. Nowhere David else Challenger, What about their the argument FDA? for accelerated approval? Well, I have trouble with that unless it's linked uh, on the other end with post-market surveillance. I mean, if you're going to short circuit the safety of the public on the front end of these approval processes, whether for devices or for drugs, then you've got to make sure that you have a credible early warning system on the, you know, to prevent the Russians from coming in over the, the, from the Arctic Circle, but an early warning system that will allow the Im immediate understanding of the various communities involved here to feed back to get that drug or get that device Why do you call it short circuit the safety of the American public? It's very pejorative. That is pejorative. Well, if you're going to short circuit on the front end, assuring. Oh, but why short? Why? The, I think their term would be make it more efficient, um, save time, save lives. You say short circuit safety. I why, say why do you think it's dangerous? You're saying it's dangerous. Why? I think it's dangerous because unless you can have early detection of problems on the on the post market side, you are endangering the public. Look, and, and I couldn't agree more, but let, let me tell you something. The, the, the whole notion that you convene a group of patients of a certain size and you test them for a certain time and then you make a declaration of a drug is a pure artifice of the kinds of statistics that the FDA uses in its conventional protocols. It's the frequentist trial. If you forgive the jargon, but the alternative I've been discussing is typically called Bayesian trials, and those are completely open-ended. No serious Bayesian says we will stop after a certain time and a certain number of patients. You keep feeding the data into the system forever, and you keep refining forever, and, and, and you put it in massive computer d d databases, which people are already doing, and, and that's the process. And you, you can have separate calls on when people can be in charging or using the drugs, but that's how you do the science. All right. and the fa the, the well, let me, let me go to Jerry Avorn. Jerry Avorn, are yeah, you a Bayesian or an anti-Bayesian? Um, <laughs> actually, I, I think there's a lot to be said for Bayesian analyses, and I know that FDA is interested in learning more about it, but that's a little arcane. Yeah, let's not. Uh, maybe to, to give a concrete example of how I mean, who could be against rapid assessment of drugs? And I can give you an example of why we can sometimes think that that's not a great idea. Uh, there was a drug approved at the very, in the last couple of days of 2012 uh, for tuberculosis. Uh, and the FDA approved it based on a, an accelerated review in which it looked at what we call a surrogate marker. That is, not did it make your tuberculosis better, but did it change some lab test? In this case, it was about how much TB bug was growing in your sputum. And that seems like a good idea because the law requires that FDA then has to follow that up with a real clinical trial where you actually follow patients and ask, does their TB get better besides does their sputum get better? Uh, the problem, that I have a longer article about this in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association a couple of weeks ago. The problem is that the FDA sped through that, approved the drug because it made the sputum get more sterile of TB drugs a couple of weeks sooner than placebo did. The only problem was that there was a five times greater death rate in the people given this new drug than the people given placebo, and most of those deaths were from tuberculosis. What about the follow-up study that the law requires FDA to do? They told the company, we want you to come back with a real clinical trial about this drug, and we want it on our desk by 2022. I think that suggests right. that the FDA but can sometimes go Scott, too far in that direction. Scott Dudley, the scenario, the scenario laid out to you, it's yeah. very compelling, it's very concerning. 
Can you respond to There's that? no question that FDA should have authority after these drugs are approved through trials to try to accelerate their development to continue to study them and collect information. But when we're dealing with unmet medical needs, life-threatening disorders, patients want access to these drugs sooner. And you talk just about review times, but the real issue here is development times, and they've been going up. And they've been going up because the trials that FDA is mandating on drug developers are more and more rigorous. They're larger and larger trials. You're talking about trials that used to be two or 3,000 patients, now are 10 or 20,000 patients. Because the FDA is wedded to an old model of statistics, and I know we don't, don't want to talk about no, statistics No, it's okay here. to talk about statistics, but why are, they, why are they seeking more statistics today than they did 10 years ago? More certainty. The, the, the more patients you can enroll, enroll in a clinical trial, the better the potential But well, why weren't, they, why weren't I, they interested I, I, in more certainty I, I, 50 years ago? I, 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 well, let me just, I just I, want, because well. I gave you quite a run, Peter. I want to hear from because you. They, be, because they were willing to embrace more uncertainty years ago when why? it came to these drugs. It was a different culture. There was, a, there was okay. a sense that there weren't a lot of drugs for a lot of these diseases, and now they have this sense that there is sort of an abundance of riches, which there really isn't when it comes to unmet medical needs. The problem is that the mindset that guides the development of new drug for hypertension, we, which we might all agree should be fairly rigorous because we have good drugs for those diseases, infects every other corner of the FDA. They don't make distinctions between drugs for very rare, very right. difficult disorders. Not enough. They do it in the oncology division to a, is to it, a point. Is this a cover your backside thing? It's absolutely. 